Testament lesson today is from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 32 to 49. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff and his hand and chose five smooth stones from the weight of and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand." When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine dead on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. Thank you, Taste. Next scripture in comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. But then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The fears. For me, that's kind of the main message for this morning. A one just centered around sort of fear. 
So what do you fear? I know I kind of shared with you this morning with the children, I'm afraid of heights, right? Uh, yes, somehow, befuddlingly, I've been able to find my way to the top of the Empire State Building. I've been on top of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Uh, I've been to the apex of the Seattle Space Needle. Um, and in case you've never been, you have to ride a glass elevator up there, which is terrifying to someone like me. See the ground get further and further away, and I, I was cursing the person that invented this torture device. Now, how could you do such a thing to someone afraid of heights? So I somehow managed to conquer those fears and find my way to the tops of those awe-inspiring buildings. But that's not the only fear that I have. I'm lucky enough to have more than just one fear in life, right? So I'm also a little afraid of spiders, in a manly way, though, of course, right? Uh, so I remember one evening I was sitting at my uh, parents' house and uh, in the bedroom, I was working on my computer, and I heard this little pitter-patter of feet on the wall. So I kind of froze and slowly turned my head to that direction to find a giant wolf spider. No joke, probably this big, but crawling on the wall. It was so big I could hear the feet, right? So I said, oh, what am I going to do? It's not small enough to use just a newspaper or a mouse that I'm using on my computer to smash it. So I ran to the laundry room, grabbed a broom, and ran back to the room, hoping it was in the same spot it was when I left it. So fortunately, it was. <laughs> it was. It was there. So I thought to myself, okay, I cannot miss this spider with my first swing. I've got to nail it. Otherwise, it's going to jump on my face or crawl away and go into my pillow. Who knows what? So I rear back. I take a big swing. Whack! I missed it. I put a big hole in the wall, and the spider somehow scurried to the top. Uh, fortunately enough, for my second swing, I got the spider, so I grabbed it, threw it in the toilet to ensure its demise and to not bother me the rest of the night. I still remember that night, and I was not too excited about it. It was a little, a little crazy. So crisis averted. I saved the day through the thinking of my broom and my ability to strike twice and put holes in the wall. So in a weird kind of way, it's good that I'm not the only one in this world that has a fear. And I know it kind of probably sounds bad or feels bad for a pastor to say that. Maybe misery loves company. But it's nice to know I'm not the only oddball that has stuff to be afraid of in life. It was very clear that the disciples were terrified on the boat that day when the storm arose and Jesus was sleeping in the stern. So their visceral response is a clear indicator that fear and terror was running amok in their minds, in their hearts, and their souls. They felt they were in such a great deal of trouble that they had to run out of options and the only thing they could do was to wake poor, sleeping Jesus Christ. So they let the fear get the best of them, which provoked them to pester Jesus. And not only did they wake him, uh, but their fear also asked them to encourage, or encourage them to incredulously ask, Teacher, don't you care that we're even going to die out here? That was the question they asked Jesus. So it's clear that they were afraid, that they were scared and terrified, and rightly so. So they felt that they were in a danger, that their decisions and their actions were all kind of dictated by the fear that they had with the storm on the boat. So this is kind of what concerns me a great deal with society as a whole in this day and age. It's the penchant of others and maybe even some companies to prey on the fear of people. For example, I remember uh, when my wife and I were pregnant with our first child, you know, kind of preparing and getting ready as first time parents and going to the store, said, hey, let's go down to Babies R Us and see what they have to offer to purchase to get ready for the baby. Oh my word, what a terrifying place to go if you don't have a child. <laughs> you go down the aisle and you see things that you never even thought of could be a fear. They give you solutions to problems you didn't even know existed. So wait, what, the baby needs to have pads on their knees when they're crawling around on the floor for protection? What? And puree baby food, who doesn't have time with a baby to puree baby food? I mean, come on. Well, yeah, you don't have a lot of time. <laughs> do we really need to get a portable prison for this baby? How much do they move around? They can't get into too much trouble. They're just a little baby. And my favorite were the little light socket covers, of which we still have about 87 lying around in our house. So if you need any, just let me know. But are the babies put their fingers into electrical outlets? Really? That's a thing? Well, yeah, I guess it is. So let's buy 2,000 of these to make sure they never do that. So it's just a fear-inducing environment. 
So some of these products you've seen think, no, why does this exist? Oh, it's because I fear for the safety and the security of my beloved child. So and essentially, these, these kind of products in some ways kind of created fears that we didn't even know existed in the first place. So the same type of fear praying, as I like to call it, is strongly seen in the media. A lot of people have a very strong fear and worry about some active shooter situation taking place. And in some ways, rightly so, we can feel helpless, like we feel overwhelming, and oh, as if we couldn't really do anything about it. And usually those stories take front page or front and center with uh, media outlets or coverage uh, throughout the nation. And they are sad and they are uh, tragic, but realistically, the odds of an actual uh, active shooter situation taking place are very slim. Uh, crunching the numbers and doing some of the research, uh, I found, in fact, someone is more than 150 times likelier to die from pneumonia or influenza than they are in an active shooter situation. That doesn't mean we shouldn't prepare or shouldn't kind of uh, get ourselves uh, set up for those kind of situations, but it shouldn't be our ongoing pervasive thought. We shouldn't live in a constant state of fear. Because then that influences and dictates how we live and uh, follow our life and what actions we take, what words we say, and what we actually think. And so we probably should maybe focus those fears or get rid of those fears and focus in a different area where we can maximize the amount of good and preparedness that we can do. Uh, furthermore, tangible items and situations and phobias associated with them are not all the only things that we fear in life. It's not just spiders or active shooters or whatever we have, the heights, those aren't the only fears that we have in life. But some exist without us maybe even knowing of their existence. Maybe they're a little subconscious fears. And so uh, one example is public speaking, right? Uh, a lot of people have a big fear of public speaking. I sometimes do, believe it or not, right? Uh, but some researchers say that public speaking is a greater fear than death for most people. Which means people would rather die than get up and speak publicly in front of others. Uh, which is understandable. It's a little intimidating sometimes, but you guys are nice, so it makes it easier for me. But to be sure, we're afraid of the many winds and the waves that assail our fragile vessels. Our lives, our churches, our cities and nations. We fear disapproval, fear rejection, a failure, the meaninglessness, illness, and of course, we fear death. Our own death, the death of those that we love, and the potential demise of the communities and institutions that we cherish. We fear possibilities and hypotheticals, depending on what is being fed to our psyches. So there lies another issue. But sometimes we fear things that don't even really exist, or fear that we shouldn't have in the first place. Uh, the example that children always seem to give is a fear of the dark. Well, what really is different about the dark other than lighting going low? Nothing around us has changed. There's no monsters that come out at night, except for maybe raccoons, but that's beside the point. But we don't have a certain things that change too much. So why do we fear the dark? Just because it's unknown to us. And it seems a little different. But plus, we do have many fears that are, in fact, very real. But we know they exist, and they exist in many areas of our lives. We just have to be careful about what we fear. And understand why maybe we fear it in the first place. Is it based on personal experience? Have we gone through some trauma that might affect us and cause us to fear someone or something in the future? Is there a low percentage of it happening, but by word of mouth, we've heard it from someone else, and now it feels like a very real possibility to happen to us? Are we being continually reminded and reiterated that this is what we need to fear? And this is why we need to fear. But I wonder if fear has too much control and influence over us. See, they dictate what we think, and how we might act, and how we might prepare for certain things in life. And so we better be aware of the presence of that fear and how it actually shapes us. A fear is a feeling, and it's very real. When we're battling and dealing with our fears, 
we usually have two hardwired options we can do when it comes to fear. We can fight it, right? So we can try to fight that fear and get rid of it. If it's a spider on our wall, we run and grab a broom, put a bunch of holes in our wall for fighting this spider. Or we can flight or fly. I could have just left out the room, uh, out the door, and ran down the street and gone a mile away from the spider, but that wasn't the best option at that time. So those are usually how we deal with our fears in the moment. So think about the disciples. What were their options? Well, they certainly couldn't fight the storm. We still can't control weather in 2018, and I'm sure they couldn't back then either. Jesus Christ is a different story, but the disciples had no control. They couldn't fight the storm. It was just upon them and doing what it does. They couldn't flee from it. It pretty much dictated where their boat was going. They couldn't steer it or row it or get it in any other direction than where the storm was dictated. And so they were at the mercy of the storm which caused their fear to grow exponentially. And they were running out of options. They were stuck and in a great deal of panic. So as such, their last resort was to approach God. Now what piece sticks out to me in particular with this encounter? And when Jesus woke from the storm, he did not tell the disciples right away to not be afraid. For there's nothing to be afraid of. And I find that pretty odd. You see, the words, do not be afraid, those four simple words are found throughout Scripture. But think of the angels when they appeared to the uh, shepherds in the field, announcing the birth of Jesus Christ. They told them, do not be afraid. They wanted to grant them peace. And to let them know there's hope in the future for a king will be born unto you, and we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And when the women and the disciples showed up at the empty tomb, there was an angel standing there. And the angel said, do not be afraid, for he has risen. And there's hope for the future. But Jesus didn't say that to his disciples. He didn't say, do not be afraid. He asked them the question, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? More or less, he was asking, did you forget that I was with you? Did you think something would happen to you with me in your midst? Do you not know that I am the Son of God? Where is your faith in me and my presence here with you? And now, having had three children, I can attest that there are many nights over the past six years where the girls have woken from their sleep, uh, just screaming in a fit of kind of fear. And there have been many uh, uh, instances of this over the years. I'm sure Alyssa could tell you of many more, but there were three that I actually attended to in those six years. Uh, but my wife graciously has done many more than that. So this one night I remember like it was yesterday. Uh, Alyssa and I swore that our children had night terrors, or at least Raylan for sure. She would wake up with a scream unlike any other scream you had heard before. It was just one that you heard, and it wasn't one that said, I need a new diaper, or I need some food, or I'm uh, thinking about what you're going to do with me tomorrow, Daddy. It's one of terror. And I'll never forget that sound. So I heard it this one night. I went running into her room. I saw her standing up on the edge of the crib, looking in tears, just streaming down her face. Her hair was drenched like someone just ducked a bucket of water right on her head from the sweat that she had in her terror. So I picked her up, and as I kind of tried to nuzzle uh, her head and my shoulders, I wiped her tears away, uh, starting to pat her back, and I like to have the head nuzzled here to calm them. Uh, so I reached over to her, and I whispered into her ear, uh, something that parents have been whispering for thousands of years. I said to her, hush, my dear, there's nothing to be afraid of. And so I continued to rock her and pat her back until she finally calmed down. But I think, maybe those weren't the right words. And maybe that's what I shouldn't have told her. Maybe the words were a little misguided. So instead of telling Raylan, hush, there's nothing to be afraid of, my love, I should have said, do not be afraid, for you are not alone. You see, we still have fears in life. Those won't dissipate. Those won't always disappear. I'll probably always have a fear of heights. Unless I climb to the building five million times, and I'm not sure that's the best idea for me. So our fears are there. There still might have been something for her to be afraid of. 
But what changed was my presence with her. I told her that I was here for her. And that's what God does for us. And frankly, we need to do that more for one another. We need to look each other in the eye and say, do not be afraid for I am here with you, my brother and sister. Whatever fears you have, we can share in them together. We can find a way to conquer them or get through them. But we can't let the fears dictate our life. We shouldn't be afraid to walk along a trail around here because there was a black bear spotted in a neighborhood. Yes, we can prepare and maybe know what to do in case we come across it, but it shouldn't inhibit us from wanting to walk on a trail. We shouldn't be afraid of sending our children to school or to church because the media likes to remind us of the very minuscule chance of a violent act occurring. We shouldn't be afraid of failing, of getting rejected, of not getting what we want or of being disappointed in life. We can't let the fear of losing our job, of isolation or pain, or sickness or financial problems, or even death, consume our hearts and our minds. Remember, it was Jesus Christ who conquered all of this through his sacrifice on the cross. Even death no longer has the final word. So we need to find some way to gravitate away from this paralyzing fear, uh, to a point of safety, security, support, and love. And that, my brothers and sisters, comes through our hope, our faith, our love, and our trust in God. That is what allows us to see the tops of these awe-inspiring buildings. That is what allows us to conquer the intimidating spider with calmness in the nights of terror, or to chance a risk of changing in the hopes of improving our own lives. It allows us to comfort that terrified child in the middle of the night and remind them that you are not alone, my love. And it all starts with our confidence and our hope in God. So let us not forget, no matter what we face in life, or how fearful we may become, or what we might have to worry about, that God is in fact with us. So no matter where we go, what we do, or who we might be, that God will not abandon us. That has to be in the center of our faith. That God is with us. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.